Oh, hey, so this one, very near and dear to my heart. Um, Rob Reed is one of my uh, favorite, favorite colleagues from Cockroach Labs. We worked together for a few years because Rob was a um, cockroach user way before we had convinced him to join the company. And Rob and I were actually teammates until last week when I am actually not at Cockroach Labs anymore. But um, but that doesn't mean I don't love my adorable roachers, um, such a lovable uh, group of people, and such amazing technology. So, oh my gosh, hi, Rob. Oh, my little Terry. Oh, this is one of the people hey. I'm going to the most. Hello. Hi, Very well, thank you. Thank you for having me. How are how are you both? Oh, we're great. And thank you for also being a Kube Crash alum. Um, <laughs> Rob was kind enough to moderate our gaming panel last time and uh it was so good we had to have him back. Also had I can't more believe you've let me back. integrated demo. So um <laughs> really, really pleased that you're here. And so with that, I think Danielle and I are gonna step back and oh wait, I have to say one thing about Rob too. Rob is so into the technologies that he loves so much that he has like this beautiful art okay. all up and down his arms that have all of the technologies that are his favorite and that cockroach logo was from the old logo from when he was a customer um and i think oh my gosh the blobs on there go for the reddest of oh oh kubernetes, kubernetes yes. I, have to, I have to get a kubernetes yes. one surely so, um, you wouldn't let yes. me on if i didn't Yes, exactly. No, that's not true. But exactly. yes, but yes, it's very good. So all I'm saying is for all of you out there, you're not really a true fan of all this technology until you get the tattoos to really solidify that. So, um, you know, just think about how you want to spend your time and the real estate that is your skin. Now, the, now is your chance, actually. AWS in, uh, reInvent, they're doing tattoos and piercings uh, as a as At a swag. reInvent in Vegas? Yeah, yep. so you can, get, you, can get a, uh, you can get a tattoo or piercing swag. So don't forget to pick up your tattoo this year. At, yeah, uh, yeah I'm going to not be having I mean, I Chicago. Skip that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just eat some pizza while I'm in Chicago. I'll we'll save the tattoos for Vegas. Yeah. <laughs> okay, wonderful. We're going to back up. So good to see you again, Rob. Take it and away. You. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen with you. Right. I think you can all see my screen. I can see my screen, which is good. Um, so I'm Rob Reed, a technical evangelist at Cockroach Labs. Um, I, As Lisa said, I've been a practitioner with Cockroach for quite a while. I, I, I would say it's a bit sad to say, but I fell in love with the database back in 2016, I think, but pre-version one. And I've been using it ever since. So I find myself now at Cockroach. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't thank Dominic Ravita for his contributions to these these slides. Um, Adrian Howard for his contributions to the amazing one of the amazing demo apps that I'll be showing today. And Flynn, obviously, he's been thanked before, but all of his contributions to to the demo as well, and everyone else. So, I'm here to talk about CockroachDB and how you can use it to achieve high resilience in a very dynamic and error prone world. So. Let's start with a brief history of where we've come from, essentially. So it also, and sorry, I'm going to be switching between light and dark. So trigger warning for anyone who hates dark and light switching. It all started back in 1970 when the term RDBMS was coined, IBM, I think. And into this tranche of single node RDBMS or DBMS systems, I would consider Oracle, MySQL, Postgres, SQL Server, etc. Um, and along came uh, NoSQL, the coin, the coin, the coin, the term was coined in 1998. Um, and into that tranche falls things like Cassandra, MongoDB, and Neo4j. All of these databases are, I, I think, crucial to the development of Cockroach. We owe a lot of our, our of where we are today, thanks to all of the developments that have been made to all of these fantastic databases over the years. In 2010, Citus was created, which allowed Postgres to be deployed across multiple nodes. And in that tranche, we see the cloud augmented databases, like, for example, AWS Aurora and GCP Postgres, etc. In 2012, the Spanner white paper from Google was released, made public. I think it was internal to Google at the time as a product, but it wasn't made available. And they released the white paper for Spanner. And, and I think that kicked off a a renaissance in RDBMS systems. SQL databases be could become distributed. And that's exactly what we did with CockroachDB. We released it in 2015 as the first public facing RDBMS that is distributed, distributed SQL database. So 
in a distributed world, there are four main pillars or tenets of a distributed SQL environment. And these are the minimum set of expectations that people can expect to rely upon a database like this. One is re resilience to failures. One is rights are correct, rights are right. The data should feel local. If you're requesting data and it's coming from the other side of the world, how do you make that data? How do you not infuriate the user with long wait times? And finally, it scales for growth. We, we start small, we don't over provision, but we grow with our business. And are we talking about each of these, these tenets and then our solution to them? So firstly, we, we look at resilience and outages are a big thing. We can't get away from outages. Over 60% of companies reported losses in 2022 alone due to cloud outages. And of those, 30% uh, 30 of them lasted over a day. That's a long period of time to be without a cloud or a cloud region or AZ. And the average cost of a downtime across all sectors and all company sizes is around $365,000 an hour. Now, obviously, this includes very big companies. Your losses will hopefully be much smaller, but that's the average. And unfortunately, what this boils down to is 80% of businesses that suffered or experienced some kind of disaster and didn't have any kind of disaster recovery process in place, they fail, their companies failed within 18 months. And 40 to 60% of small businesses who experienced disaster with or without any kind of plan in place for disaster were out of business within a year. So being resilient to outages is absolutely fundamental to business. So what do we do? What do CockroachDB do to help with the resilient side of things? Firstly, it's an, it's an appreciation that failure will happen. And, and for, personally, I think it's a migration from the mindset of disaster recovery, which assumes that it's the hope that disaster won't happen, but you trust that the people you hire in your employ will know what to do if it does happen. To a more, I would say, modern mindset, which is a disaster prevention mindset. This says we know disaster will happen, and when it does, we trust that the tools we have in place will help us through that disaster, hopefully without noticing it. So redundancy is essential. These, these colorful blocks here are what we would call replicas in CockroachDB. And you'll see in a minute, I, I'll knock one of these nodes out and, and we'll see what happens. But essentially we achieve consensus between these, what we would call ranges in CockroachDB through a protocol called Raft which is similar to Google Spanner. I think that uses Paxos. We had to modify Raft to make it a little bit more scalable for the amount of data that we're dealing with and the amount of ranges we deal with. Um, and we worked on that, that fork of Raft with etcd. So I'll knock out a node now. Now, please don't sue me, family guy. Let's hide him. So this node, node three, has gone away. And with that, we've lost two of our three red replicas and two of our three blue replicas. Now what CockroachDB will do is the leaseholder for those ranges, the the node or the, the, the thing that controls reads and writes to that very specific range will duplicate that data to other nodes. Just so we've been brought back up to our replication factor of three. Three is the default in CockroachDB. You can tweak it, but three is the default. So the leaseholders replicate data amongst the surviving nodes. And once the node comes back online, if it comes back online, data will be rebalanced over to it. If it doesn't, you can bring a new node up and data will be rebalanced over to those. And that's also how we scale. So it's not just node outages, this kind of resilience scales. It, we can also survive AZ outages or region outages. We can even, as this diagram shows, survive cloud outages depending on how we deploy. If we deploy across a number of cloud providers and for example, worst case scenario, AWS were to experience an entire cloud outage. If you're also in GCP, you can survive an outage in AWS. And, and I like this quote from Bose. Um, we used it at Google Next a couple of days ago. And, and they say, we've literally been unable to kill this thing no matter what we've thrown at it. And I've heard other anecdotes where people say during game days where they're trying out their architecture and seeing where it breaks, the database team, it's kind of a day off for them because they're running Cockroach and they, they trust that it just takes over where everything goes wrong. The next section is rights are right. So correctness of data. So in any database, you should expect 
any successful application, you expect many simultaneous users, high concurrency, and everyone's performing critical operations. Every, every, everything that I do is going to be critical to me. Transactions can't be lost. They can't be made on stale or out of date data. If you're operating on data that is stale, how do you know what is a true reflection of that data? Transactions must be fast. People will leave your website if they detect that it's slow. It will annoy them, and I'll get onto that in a minute. And transactions mustn't fail. Now, the, there are varying isolation levels in a database, uh, and they, it differs from database to, to database, but there are different isolation levels. CockroachDB is by default serializable, which limits any of these types of anomalies from occurring. It's always serializable, and it's always serial, serializable globally. So no matter how, your, how big your database grows, it's always you can always trust that your data is correct. So writes are always right. The next area is data should feel local. There's something called the 100 millisecond phenomenon. I don't know if that's the official name, but there is a phenomenon whereby we can detect if something is slow. And I think the minimum threshold for perceptibility to a user is around 100 milliseconds. Anything longer than that, it starts to become noticeable. Anything lower than that, great. But higher than that, you want to avoid. And Amazon actually found in a, in a I don't know if it was a study or just an accident, I'm not sure, but they found that for every 1% of, uh, for every 100 milliseconds, sorry, additional latency to a request, they lost 1% of sales. And obviously a company like Amazon, that's 1% of sales is a very big, um, a big number. And a lot of our companies are operating with a global user base. So data should feel local to everyone, no matter where they are in the world. And one of the, um, one of the, I've just seen Flynn's message. <laughs> it is, it's a real phenomenon. And the speed of light is a big competitor to any distributed SQL database. We can't get around the speed of light. So we need to work around, we need to work around it. So the way we solve for data, data locality is we use topology patterns. Uh, I'll get onto those in the next slide, but we can pin data to certain regions. So if I'm in Europe and I only care about European data, or my data has to reside within Europe, I'm only interacting with European data. I'm not going to the other side of the world to fetch my data. So data is local to me. And this, this reduces um, operational overheads because I'm not relying on data to be in different regions. So therefore I'm cutting out a lot of the network bandwidth that travels between regions if I'm pinning it to a certain region. That's fine, you're not distracting me at all. So the topology patterns. Follow the workload is the first one. This is the default topology pattern in CockroachDB. This allows low read latencies from the current busiest region. And what I mean by that is, let's say it's a let's say your business follows a traditional follow the sun work model and it's predictable. Everyone in, I'll do it your side, I think this is your way. Everyone in, let's say Japan comes online and all the leaseholders are moved over to that area so that they can serve reads and writes quickly. Writes would have to replicate to other regions so that when the leaseholders move and people come online in India say, the leaseholders are there and everyone in India enjoys low reads and writes, or especially reads to that, to that area. And it will carry on moving west as the day progresses finally to the west coast of the States. Let's say your database is arranged like that. The default pattern, but not always the best. Next we have follower reads. You can do what's called a time travel queries, which is select star from table as of system time. And I think the default for a follower read is around four milliseconds of staleness. So you can opt in to slightly stale data to reduce your read latency. That's one pattern. Um, another pattern is global tables. So you get low read latency, no matter where you are in the world, at obviously the cost of higher writes because data needs to be written to multiple geographic regions in order to satisfy that. I'll show you an example of a global table in a bit. Regional tables, if you have, let's say, an admin table that you don't want to leave the data, you don't want to leave the states, for example, everyone accessing it is in the states. The data doesn't have to be anywhere else. It can always be within one, re one region. So it's low read and write latency for everyone in that region. And finally, it's regional by row. That This is when we talk about geo partitioning, this is what we're talking about. That pins data to a region. So me in the UK, my nearest data, set, data center might be EU West 2, which is London or EU Central 1, both in the case of AWS. And my data would be pinned to that region. So it won't leak into um, the US. I know that the um, there was a data regulation that was in place and recently invalidated due to the Shrems 2 lawsuit. 
and now data can no longer freely travel from Europe to the States without prior consent of an individual. So there's a lot of things that you need to be aware of when operating at a global scale. And it's not a free lunch. So this is going to be forced interactive fun time. I'm not expecting any, any comments in here, but have, have, have a think to yourself what you think the performance characteristics of an application like this would be. And, and when I speak to people, it's actually, it surprises me that people architect their applications in this way. It's, it's quite a natural way to think. I want my applications in, in the US, let's say. That's where my, my cloud service provider or maybe my Vercel serverless edge function, for example, exists. But I don't want my data to leave Europe. My user is in, is in the UK. So a couple of seconds to think about that. Okay, so what we're actually going to see is the user makes a request to the the application, which happens to be in America. That's a hop of around 5,500 uh, 5, 5, 5, kilometers. That makes a request to the database to fetch the user's data. Now, obviously, that data is transiting now between geographies, which isn't necessarily okay. But that adds another 5,500 kilometers on. The data is returned from the database back to the application. That's another 5,500 kilometers. And finally, the application returns that request data back to the user at a cost of another 5,500 kilometer round trip. All in all, we're looking at a round trip of 22,000 kilometers for this one request. Now, at this at the scale of the planet, that's that's a, over half of the planet circumference, and that's a that's a long time. So. We So as much as possible, try and co-locate your users to your applications and try and co-locate your applications with the database. Now, obviously, we don't have a presence in the US anymore, but we've moved all of the compute over to where the user is. But that allows you to scale. We can scale into new markets as we need to. We have database nodes where the users are. We have applications where the users are, and everything stays local to the user. Data feels local. So everyone has a good experience of using your application. And that's exactly what we've done with an application called Roach Roast, which I'm sure you'll agree when you see it, is uh, is in no way contrived and highly mission critical. So this is an application that um, I put together with Adrian Howard. Um, he put all of this front end together. He did a lot of legwork on this. So what we what we can see is this is a UK user using an application, and they can you can see the latencies that they're seeing. We saw about 16 milliseconds to the UK. 97 milliseconds to the United States. Mexico, they're seeing around 132 milliseconds. Um, everything's localized to that market. And in Germany, around 40 milliseconds to EU Central 1. Now, I, you can't see that really, really well, but that's, they're talking to the EU, I'll pause it actually. They're talking to the EU West 1 CockroachDB instance. And I'm using Fly.io in this application. So that is talking, I don't know why it's LHR. I guess that's London Heathrow. They, I think they use airport names. I don't know why, but that's a London-based application. So my application is in London, my user is in London, and my database is in Frankfurt. So, uh, sorry, West One Island. So everything's quite local. But not everyone in the UK might speak English. So we want to be able to change that to make sure that it feels local to everyone in every regard. Let's say we have a German speaker in Germany. Fine. But maybe we have a, a, a Japanese speaker in Germany. We achieve that by using a global table, so a regional table to store all of the market information, the products, so that all of the information that you see in these boxes here, so the amount, the currency, things like that, and the product names. But we add translations, which we store in a global table. So that's immediately accessible with very low latencies to anyone in the world. So whether you're a Chinese speaker in France or a French speaker in Japan, it doesn't matter. Now I'll switch over to a United States user. So you can see. As of my next request, I'll make a request to the US. And now I'm seeing 8 milliseconds for a US user, whereas before I was seeing 97 milliseconds. I'm now connected to US East 1. And my fly region is now over in the States. My locale is still in Japanese. 73 milliseconds to UK, 70, uh, 97 or something like that to Mexico. And it's happened too quickly. I've, uh, <laughs> I should have left a little bit more time. But you can see I'm getting low latency reads from this database because I've positioned my application close to my database, which is in turn close to my users. Uh, it's trying to play again, so I'll cancel that. There we go. So the next one is scaling for growth. If your application is popular, which I hope it will be, your scaling should be automatic. It, it, you shouldn't have to think, or at least it should be a very low 
effort and lift in order to scale your database. You shouldn't have to think, or any kind of application, you shouldn't have to make a conscious effort to automatically scale up and scale down your application infrastructure to cope with demand. You should scale for reads and writes. And I personally don't think there's any, the term unprecedented demand, um, as one of my colleagues would say, is BS. And, and essentially, that I, I think that's true because satisfying user demand is our reason for being. That's why we do what we do. We we try to scale for demand. And if our applications scale gracefully, there's no reason we couldn't scale to the moon to support our user base. And it should be affordable. We shouldn't penalize people for, for large scale deployments. So I'm going to take you on a very quick whirlwind tour of CockroachDB now. So CockroachDB brings together the best of, of all worlds. So the RDBMS systems, Oracle, MySQL, et cetera, they were great at ASIC compliance, consistency, reliability, and everything like that. But they weren't necessarily designed for scale. They weren't designed to run horizontally necessarily because the world didn't require it at the time. NoSQL databases, fantastic at scale, but not as, as um, but their reason, their raison d'etre, if you will, wasn't consistency necessarily a lot of our uh, no sql databases are eventually consistent and that's that's their that's their model that's completely fine so then we've got cloud and that, with that it gives us potentially infinite scale but the ability to elastically scale to scale back to zero when we no longer need anything and we've taken all of that and we've created a product from it so it's a distributed database built from the ground up and we had to build there was nothing like this when we when we came along so we had to build something new we've built it to be wire compatible with postgres but we couldn't use Postgres because it wasn't designed from the ground up to be as scalable as we needed it to be. It wasn't designed to be resilient against multiple failures in a geographically dispersed environment. So we built it from scratch. And it's not that just the data that's distributed. I think an interesting facet of CockroachDB is it's distributed SQL execution. So a request comes in. It comes into the SQL layer. Essentially, you're talking SQL to Cockroach, but under the hood, CockroachDB is a monolithic key value store. Um, not sure if you knew that, but now you do. Uh, the request comes in, and the nodes know where the data is. So your the load balancer could have sent you over here to node one. It could have sent you over to node two. Every node is the same in CockroachDB. Every node can handle reads and writes, and every node can act as a gateway node into the system. Taking a step up a little. Um, if we're looking at a multi-tenant multi -tenant environment like CockroachDB serverless, um, the request could come in from any of these tenant nodes, which are private to those tenants, and they go, they go into a shared storage layer. But it's all private because of the way we've uh, we've developed the key value store in serverless to be multi-tenanted. So no one can see anyone else's data. And taking a look in a Kubernetes-specific environment, serverless runs on Kubernetes. That's how we're able to scale to zero. The load balancer will point to a proxy pod. Um, there might be uh, there will be multiple proxy pods, but they'll go to different SQL pods, and we can spin up SQL pods um, depending on the amount that they're being used by a tenant. So, for example, tenant four is using more resources than say tenant one, two, or three. They go to the the storage pods, which are ultimately disassociated from the underlying block storage, and that's in a cloud environment with a on premise deployment of CockroachDB. You would want to manage your own hardware. So now I'm going to talk about resilience. So initially, I'm going to use the the multi-cloud demo, the, the multi-region demo, sorry, that um, Flynn has worked very hard on. So I'll play that. And what I'm going to demonstrate in this example is a node failure and then a region failure. So I'm going to be targeting the US East for no other reason than that was the one in the middle, and it happened to be a good one to, to try. And I'm going to knock out a node, um, giving it zero grace period, and I'm going to force it. I'm going to delete cockroachdb pod zero. So I'll run that. And in a second or two, you'll see that, and this is just a recording, but you'll see that this will go to uh, draining, which means no requests are being sent to it from the load balancer. And then it will go to suspect. So CockroachDB suspects that something is wrong with this node. It can't talk to it. Therefore, it can't consider. This is the, the same as I showed you in the previous example with the fiery node. This is node three. This is what happened to node three. It's, it's now under-replicated, where it had replicas on that node. It no longer has replicas. It's just come back. Um, the, the node is now live again, and it's going to now, CockroachDB is now going to replicate data back onto it. So that replication of 36 is now going to drop back down to zero because nothing is under replicated anymore. 
Next, I'm going to do something a little bit worse. Um, I'm going to scale the replica set down to zero for US East. So we'll see basically the same thing, but across all three of the nodes. So the, the live status will drop to either draining or suspect, depending on how quickly they the cockroach DB noticed. So we can see that we've got one suspect node and two draining nodes. They will eventually become suspect nodes and we'd get three suspect nodes. And then the under replicated ranges will climb up because now we've lost three nodes where we had data before. And because it's distributed across multiple nodes, we've still got enough replicas to run with, but we are under replicated. We do need to sort this out. So I'll bring that back online. I'll bring the replica set back up to three replicas and CockroachDB will realize these nodes will rejoin the cluster and they'll go back to live. The suspect nodes will drop down to zero and the under replicated ranges will go back to zero indicating that the cluster is fully replicated again. And with that, we'll go to the next demo. So this is a this is a different cluster. I've already recorded a video for this, so it made sense to just re reuse this one. I've got a multi-region cluster in Azure with three nodes uh, in each region, so for, for a total of nine nodes. And what I'm going to demo in this example is a version upgrade. So how you can upgrade CockroachDB with zero downtime, and also how you can scale the cluster manually if needs be. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to scale up, um, I'm going to upgrade with a, a, a stateful set patch to version 23.1.3 from 23.1.2. I'm going to run it against the North Europe region. As with before, um, we drain the nodes, so we don't receive any more connections to that because we're about to knock it out of the cluster. And in fact, we don't actually see it go to uh, a suspect node because it happens very quickly. I'm not deleting a pod. I'm simply recycling a pod with a newer image version. So that's already happened. CockroachDB has realized that there are um, there are no under-replicated ranges because it happened very quickly. But we, uh, but Cockroach knows that it's running with mixed versions now. The primary version is 23.1.2, but we are now running with different versions, and it, it knows which those are. It's docking out the second. That's just completed. So we've got two ver two nodes now running 23.1.3. And we're just doing it to the last one that's just come up with 23.1.3. There are some under replicated ranges which are now going to be rebalanced across to that new 23.1.3 node. Now I'm going to scale up the North Europe region. And this is all happening in Azure. I'm going to scale it up to five nodes. And what we'll see here is the node count of three. Thank you, other cursor. Is about to pop up to five. And down here we can see that a few seconds ago, we received nodes CockroachDB3 and CockroachDB4 into the cluster. And what we'll see here, thank you, little cursor, is these replicas are going to start to come over from the other nodes. All of the nodes talk to each other. Um, the person who developed this, that one of the key developers on this geo um, awareness of CockroachDB, likens it to an ant colony, that each, each node is an ant. Uh, they only have to worry about a certain number of things. Do I have enough data? Do I have too much data? Do I need to give data away? And that happens around, I think, every 300 milliseconds. So every 300 milliseconds, the nodes are talking amongst themselves to say, can I have more data if I need it? Do you need, is, the, is it replicated enough? So that's the end of, of my talk. I've, I realize I've blitzed past, uh, blitzed through it. So we're still on track. Um, I'll hover on this page for um, a couple of seconds, just if you want to take any pictures. There's um, a great blog, um, which I've contributed to, and a lot of my really smart colleagues um, have contributed to. There are release notes for all of the releases that we've made, um, some overviews of multi-region, um, how, we, how we do multi-region in CockroachDB. Cockroach University, which has been amazing to a lot of people. Uh, there's some really good courses in university if you're if you're curious about getting acquainted with CockroachDB. And there's a community Slack channel. So feel free to join that. We're all in there and we're all available to answer questions. Uh, uh, thank you very much. Thanks for having me.
I'm going to join while we wait for Lisa and Danielle. But thank you so much, Rob. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's Looks been a pleasure. Here yeah, we sorry about that. We were, Our camera was <laughs> stuck. Um, okay, but we, we got it sorted out. Rob, amazing. And also, you finished so quickly. Are there more um, questions for Rob? I saw a few of them come up. And Sean is... Wait, is Sean asking me a question? Just a recommendation. If they are new to local development, Docker Desktop has simple checkbox to spin up a cluster so they can get started right away. Oh, I think I Sean think is answering, mm -hmm. yeah, the question that I reposted from the other. Oh, so God, because I'd have had no idea how to answer that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> those of you that are still lurking in the other registration area and posting questions there, please click the stage button. I know it's really confusing. I know a bunch of you have DM'd me. I know I've been, everybody has been like trying to get us, get our attention. Poppin is a bit of a confusing platform, but there is a little button with the movie icon on the left side that says stage. And if you click on that, then you'll be in the chat that all of the presenters can see, but apparently not all the presenters can chat in until they finish and like with Flynn, how I was reposting these things, but at least they'll be able to see it. So, um, so we have some time, Rob. So there's a few questions um, from Sean. So I think why don't we ask, why don't we ask one of these questions live for you? So, so um, I'm probably first, not the best. Oh, you go ahead. Sorry, you go ahead, Daniel. Oh, how does Cockroach DB differentiate differentiate itself from other databases designed for Kubernetes? So um, I wouldn't say we are a database designed for Kubernetes. Being a cloud native database, we work well on Kubernetes. Ultimately, CockroachDB is deployed as a single binary. So it doesn't matter where it is. If you deploy it on Metal, that's fine. If you want to package it up in a Docker container, that's fine. If you want to orchestrate that Docker container in Kubernetes, that's also fine. Um, uh, in, in terms of the differentiation, we don't have to run in Kubernetes. I don't think we were designed for it necessarily. Um, but things like stateful sets and persistent volumes and PVCs work really well for something like cockroach db and it allows us to host our main cloud offerings serverless and dedicated on kubernetes um in terms of the differences between cockroach um and what the other database is tidyb and vitesse i'm honestly i'm not 100 percent sure probably not the best person to answer that specific question because especially when you talk about kubernetes as a comparison i probably not the deepest expert in kubernetes i'm afraid i know that's probably uh, sacrilege. Yeah, and there's a lot of um, info on on the web about this. Um, if you go to look at some of the blogs, like about how Cockroach is acid compliant, um, is you know going to be one of the ways where it's truly distributed SQL as opposed to maybe other databases that aren't 100% distributed SQL, not all of the letters um, in in acid. So there, there's a lot of information out there. Um, if I had my other computer and I had a whole list of blogs I could pull up, but if you had asked me that a week ago, um, but there's a lot of information um, about about differentiation uh, on there. Um, but you know, there's not a lot of distributed SQL databases out there. But I would say, from my experience and the three years that I worked there, uh, CockroachDB is truly distributed SQL, which gives it a lot of advantages over other databases. Yeah, yeah. And, and and thank you, Lisa. I think one of the other differentiators um, is the the SQL executor. So there is a SQL optimizer that is aware that it is distributed. So if you make a query, it knows the environment in which it's working and it'll optimize your queries accordingly. So everything within Cockroach was designed for being distributed. There are some other questions yeah. if I've got them. Um, yeah, and um, Rob already talked about like not eventual consistency, but immediately consistent. You know, there there's a lot of things there that you can um, lean into. A lot of goodness, but it really just depends on your use case. I mean, we're not here to to like um, degrade any other technology. It really depends on your use case and what workloads you want to run and what you really need to do for you to pick the the one that's going to work for you. So I'm going to go to the kind of third part of the question, which is CockroachDB promotes itself as a survivable database, which I love because cockroaches survive and you know survive and mm -hmm. we'll, we'll the, um, the survive the apocalypse. Yep. So how does it ensure data availability and consistency in case of node failures in a Kubernetes cluster? Yep. Good question. So underneath the covers, we I mentioned or touched upon briefly uh, the raft consensus algorithm. So fundamentally, if you take your database table and chop it into bits, those bits are called ranges. And each range goes on to different um, machines for as, or replicas 
as, as replicated versions of that data. Now, if you take out any one of those versions of the data, there are still two left in there and, and the raft protocol knows that. If you write to Cockroach, you're interacting with the raft leader under the covers. We call it a leaseholder, but ultimately under the covers, you're talking to the raft leader. That will orchestrate reads and writes to that data. So it's there's no single entry point for writes because every all of the different ranges of data can be on different nodes. So you're talking to the raft leader and that will orchestrate the writes. If, uh, if any one of those followers goes away, the raft, uh, the raft will detect it and it will know that something's not quite right. If you bring in another node, it will replicate to that one as well. And it, it always does, uh, I think 150 to a two, two, 250 milliseconds, there's always a, there's a new election term in Raft. So the, the leaseholders always have a chance to move around the cluster depending on where they're needed. So that's how I would suggest, uh, that's how I would answer it. I'm going to do another talk um, on distributed SQL soon. So, um, so keep on following on Twitter. I, I, probably the best place um, because I'll be going into that in a lot more detail. Awesome. And maybe you can put your Twitter um, link in the chat when you do there. Now, there are plenty of other questions from Sean that we invite you to answer when um, when you're done. Um, uh, I'm just like, yeah. So we still have a bit of time. Should we ask? Um, gosh, I don't know. Rob, can you see the the chat? It's, it's, I can. can see. Yeah. Uh, so there's so, one, I, the word ETL. Um, is is highlighted to me because it's in caps. So um, integration with pro uh, with processing and ETL tools, um, we have a, a CDC, change data capture, which a lot of the other databases do. Ours is distributed. Um, and that, best, that allows you to publish webhook notifications or Kafka messages from data changes in Cockroach. So if you want to hook data changes up to Cockroach, you can drive it from Cockroach. And those event messages will be published via CDC, webhook, Kafka, or otherwise. Um, to, to Kafka, and that can then enter your CDC stream. Um, we can also um, ingest data through e um, ETL streams. There's, there's a tool called Benthos, which is a fantastic tool, uh, but we can also receive data from tools like Amazon DMS um, if you want to do a, a migration, for example. So it's quite open. Um, and anything you can talk to a SQL database, um, we do our communication over gRPC, you'll be able to talk to Cockroach in terms of input and output. But in terms of output specifically, um, a CDC is a good option, but you can also export data in whatever format you like. You can also back it up on schedules into S3 or various other outputs as well. So there's a lot of flexibility as, how, as to how you interact with your data. Yeah. There's also one comment in here that I want to just clarify a little bit um, about Cockroach uh, and Postgres. Um, because I, I just, there's, there's some misunderstandings. Cockroach is not Postgres. It's Postgres wire compatible. It's based on the Postgres wire um, protocol, wireframe, but it's not, it's its own database. It's not Postgres, but the things that you run on Postgres will run on it. But a lot of people have that, you know, they think it's a Postgres fork or it's somehow built based on Postgres. And that's not actually uh, the case. Um, but yes, it's not MySQL. It is Postgres wire compatible, but I don't know, Rob, if you want to say anything more about that. No, I think that's it. And I also touched upon it in the in the talk. We had to we had to design something and rebuild something from the ground up. Cockroach is um, is written in Go. Uh, it was a, a scalable language. It's easy to bring people up to date, uh, up to scratch with Go. And it's also, I would perhaps argue, um, I don't know if this is going to be a popular choice, but I would argue it's the language of the cloud, um, and increasingly so. Tools like Kubernetes, Docker, they're all written in Go. Um, HashiCorp, a lot of their tooling is written in Go. So it was a natural choice because there's a, a large cohort of the development community, especially in the cloud, speak Go. And I've just seen the why the, why the name Cockroach. Um, if I can speak on behalf of the founders, uh, have you ever tried to kill a cockroach? <laughs> um, it's uh, they, they joke that there's going to be two things that survive a nuclear apocalypse. One is going to be cockroaches and the other is going to be Keith Richards. And, and I think uh. calling something Keith Richards DB would have been silly. So uh, cockroach is a little bit awkward. <laughs> I never heard that one in my three years there. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, and we just got back from GoForCon. I see Dave Moore and shout out to David. Um, we just had a great show uh, two weeks ago in, in San Diego. So hi to, to all of you that were there that came by the booth um, and said hi. And, and you touched on Pebble, um, so which was which was a great uh, topic of GoForCon at our booth um, and fabulous technology. So okay, I think if um, I think 
Flynn is reacting to the the cockroach joke and <laughs> not to the rap pebble. Hi, David. Oh, love my roachers. Okay. So I think with that, um, I think if Rob sticks around, if there's any more questions, Rob, scroll up because there's one that I reposted that I thought was for Andy, but maybe it's more of a database session or I don't know, just kind of make sure we didn't miss anything or if there's anything else you want to touch on, um, you can continue to type in the in the chat. Oh, okay. Trevor, oh. do you mind if Rob answers that offline? Um, that's a really good point um, about spatial data. And okay, so that, we'll leave that to you to answer. Yeah, I will. I'll answer Thank that asynchronously. You, Thank you. Oh, oh. Ah. Cut them off.